Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this presentation of the CMT Association. My name is Tyler Wood, and for about the last decade, I've been a managing director at the CMT Association, uh, helping advance the discipline of technical analysis. With me today is Stanley Dash, CMT, who is our CMT program director, and we welcome you all. Thank you much, so much for those of you in uh, North America joining us early on a uh, Wednesday morning. Let's get started. A uh, few housekeeping announcements. I wanted to let everybody know of the hundreds that are online. I know there are going to be questions throughout this presentation. By all means, throw those into the chat. I'll make sure that we get to those uh, throughout the presentation where it's uh, cogent. And at the end, we'll try to answer a few of those as well. A couple quick updates from the association itself. I know about half of you on this program this morning are already registered for your CMT exams coming up in December. Uh, and about the other half of you are considering whether or not it makes sense to dedicate the next uh, couple years of your life to sitting for these rigorous exams and investing in yourself and your investment discipline. So here's the update. Uh, the next chance for you to sit for the CMT exams is coming up this December, the 2nd through the 12th, December 2 through 12, 2021. And right now we're in the standard registration period. You've got about 100 days left to study, and uh, hopefully after today's presentation, you're going to understand some of the tools that you're going to learn in the program. So let's dive right in. Uh, welcome, and uh, let's talk a little bit first about the association. For the half of you who are on here that may not have a whole lot of experience with what our organization does, uh, it's really two-pronged. We are here to advance the discipline of technical analysis, and we do that by providing two key things to our members and charter holders. One is that we help improve their investment decision-making. That's all of the studying, that's the learning that you're gonna go through in the CMT program, as well as all of our continuing education activities. The second is the value of the CMT charter itself. When that is on your research report, when that's on your business card, when your clients come into the office and see that you have that credential, that is gonna create uh, trust, from them to you in your process that signifies to the financial services industry that you have the dedication and the competency to be a professional technical analyst. Uh, so we exist to help open those doors and create career opportunities, both for current or aspiring professionals. So if you fall into either of those two categories, you're in the right spot. All right, quick history lesson. Uh, the CMT Association is about 50 years old and it started with a very dedicated group of volunteers uh, right in downtown Manhattan, New York, uh, but it's expanded greatly over uh, over time. We now have over 10,000 candidates in the CMT program at one of the three levels progressing towards their charter. We represent members in over 137 countries. Uh, and actually, I think this uh, top left number about the participants in our education is actually quite a bit higher uh, in terms of the thousands of people who come to conferences, events, webinars, local chapter meetings, of course, in the pre-COVID environment, uh, when we could all get together in the flesh. But here we are today online, and it's still a powerful network of members all over the world. In fact, perhaps closer now than it was even two years ago. So we're glad that you're here from wherever in the world you're joining us. Uh, we talked a little bit about that mission, those two things, to improve investment decision-making and open career opportunities. This is just a quick note about all of the educational content that the CMT Association produces. Uh, we actually just opened the Charles H. Dow Award. That's a research competition every year given to those who are advancing the discipline of technical analysis, new expressions, new ways of uh, using technical tools or even developing new tools. Uh, and that has been going on for decades. Uh, we do a lot in terms of career development. Uh, my colleagues and I talk to employers the world round, as well as national regulators. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how FINRA had uh, exempted CMT charter holders from some licensing exams, and we continue that advocacy work all over the globe. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the CMT Association, all of that uh, archived content and uh, continuing education, by all means, Head over to cmtassociation.org after this presentation and uh, let's make sure that you can find all of that great content. All right, now into the meat of this stuff. Why would somebody dedicate their life to studying technical analysis, in particular going through the CMT program where the exams are extremely rigorous, where there is a ton of material to study, while it's going to take your nights and weekends, take you away from uh, whatever pastime you, you do to relax, 
It's for this reason. The value of the CMT association, of the CMT designation cannot be overstated. We've, we've done some survey work. We've heard from our members and charter holders just what it has done for them. And obviously, an organized uh, credential body of knowledge to, to move through all of the subject matter, that's extremely helpful. For a lot of folks, they've learned some technical analysis on the trading desk or on the job uh, through professional practice, but this is an organized study plan. They've also talked about how it presents differentiated value. In a sea of other uh, financial charters, uh, the CMT really sticks out as uh, a specialty, as somebody who has a unique value and a unique perspective on financial markets. But more specifically, we've asked them how it's affected their career in the year after they attained the designation. So this uh, this great graphic that we've got on the right-hand side, our, uh, our, our design team put together, just showing those survey results about what sort of uh, opportunities people attain. So obviously promotions, new positions, uh, salary increases, those are all important, but it's right here. More responsibility. Almost 60% of new CMT charter holders reported having greater responsibility on the job after receiving their charter. And greater responsibility translates to more assets under management, meaning either their firm or more clients have given them, entrusted them with their wealth to manage through their disciplined process. That to us just speaks volumes to the value of the CMT program in terms of its uh, recognition throughout the industry. And uh, we, we certainly encourage all of you on the path to attaining your charter uh, to think about how much value you're going to bring and, and just that instant credibility of your competency in the professional sphere. All right, folks often ask me, particularly young people in university and, and college, thinking about what sort of career path does this open up for me? Is it, is it so highly specialized? You know, what, what am I gonna be able to do with a CMT designation? Uh, so this uh, very messy pie chart shows you that we've got a wide distribution of job roles, people who are investment strategists or publishing research analysts on the sell side, but also a ton of buy side roles in terms of investment advisory, uh, people who are portfolio managers ranging up and down the scale from sovereign wealth funds to uh, private family offices and small RIAs. So the, the world is really your oyster. You can apply a disciplined approach to market analysis in any job role and it adds value. Um, so that's just a, a, a quick, quick note on the career opportunities. What I want to do now is bring on my colleague, Stanley Dash, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about how we define technical analysis at the CMT Association. We're gonna talk a little bit about those tools that you're gonna learn in the program. And then I'm gonna wrap us up a little bit more detail about the exam process itself. Uh, so for those of you who are already registered, grab those notebooks, grab your coffee cup, here we go. Stanley is going to uh, walk us through a little bit more about what you can expect in the CMT program. Let me hand over the controls to you, Stanley. One moment. Thanks, Tyler. All righty. And we're there. I don't seem to have those controls. <laughs> I love I love how technology sometimes really helps us out and sometimes is an go. absolute disaster. Try it again there, Stan. I think I think I think it took the command, so let's there go. There we go. All right. I've been accused of being out of control before. So all right. Here we go. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background here, Stan? Yeah, I just wanted to pop open this slide, and there, there are just a, a few things here. Um, there we go, I think. There we go. There we go. Let's hope it stays right there. Um, I, I put this up here not to um, not to belabor the many uh, roles that I've had in in on Wall Street and trading and markets and exchanges. Um, I did want to get across one point. You can glance through this on your own. But one of the points I wanted to make is it says charter holder since 2014. So I was already in on Wall Street and involved in trading. I was a member of exchanges. I was involved in writing algos for many, many years before I decided to sit for the exams and get my charter. I was actually a member of the um, 
CMT Association for years before I decided to sit for the charter. And I say that because it came to a point where um, I wanted, I, I had a, a, a group of CMT charter holders who were reporting to me at a firm I was working at, and yet I didn't have the CMT charter, so there was a little bit of a challenge there to, to prove myself. Um, and in addition to the fact that I, I wanted to um, take that challenge and um, organize and codify a lot of what I had learned over decades of practice. And I tell you that story because I want to encourage you, those of you out there who may say, well, I've been doing technical analysis a long time, or who may say that, uh, uh, that what can I possibly get out of this? There, there is the value of, again, organizing that information. Um, there was a lot that I, a lot that I already knew, a lot that I learned, but a lot that I knew that I was able to um, put into place and organize in a way that I hadn't before, even though I'd been practicing for a long time. And in addition, uh, in addition to the fact that it gave me that credential, it gave me that uh, calling card that that Tyler was talking about. So even for those of you who may be experienced in financial markets and may be experienced with technical analysis, there is a value through going through this process, through organizing uh, your knowledge and through earning the credential. Um, this is a little slow to advance. Let so, me uh, let me switch that over for you. Okay. Good, excellent, thank you. Um, so I wanna talk about a few things um, in the time uh, that I have to speak with you this morning. Some of it will be definitions that you already know, but it'll give us this, a common vocabulary and a common set of definitions. And then a few details about some of the material uh, that's in the, in, the, uh, in, in the CMT program. Um, so you get some sense and flavor of, of how these, uh, what's in there and, and how they're used and, and how they're presented in fact in the, in the uh, CMT program. So the, the definition of technical analysis so that we have a, a, a common, um, common language. I put up a very simple definition, the study of price action and market statistics, such as volume. You can also include open interest uh, for futures markets. You can include other data on options markets. It's the study of that price action and market statistics to infer price trends and manage risk. I can't really think, I have a few more definitions, but I can't really think of a more concise way to talk about what technical analysis is. We're gonna focus on um, the action in the marketplace, uh, price trends primarily, but also volume, again, open interest. I mentioned the statistics related to options and certain external data in our program. A few of the other definitions, and these are primarily from authors who are, who are part of our, our program, whose works part of our program. A systematic evaluation of price and volume for floor, purpose of price forecasting, that's from Perry Kaufman, who's a, a main part of our program. The study of the action of the market itself, price, volume, time. I think I, I used, when I was lecturing a lot on technical analysis, I would only include time as a valid element. I was working a lot with short-term traders and I thought it was valid <clears throat> to look at um, not just time in terms of cycles, but time in terms of time of day, day of the week, um, uh, what point of the month we're in uh, as part of um, technical data. It's market data. The technician asks what is happening instead of why is it happening? And that's not to debunk the question of why is it happening. That's not to say that a fundamental analyst, a securities valuation analyst, isn't going to look at why is it happening. That's perfectly valid. <clears throat> but there's a why is it happening, but there's also the observation is what is happening. I know that um, very often the baseball team, my favorite baseball team, will put a lot of good players out there and will not always produce a win. And um, you can see you can see trends and cycles in, in some of that as well, regardless of who the players are. I may have an idea on the valuation, but that doesn't necessarily tell me what is happening right now as we get near the end of our baseball season here in North America. <laughs> I put that last bullet up there, supply and demand for shares or contracts. That's an expression that some of my uh, colleagues like to use. And I thought it was a very valid point. We were trying to distinguish the what is happening from the why is it happening. We we're trying to distinguish the difference uh, between what the value of a security should be or, or is modeled to be versus what is the actual supply and demand for the shares. A company may be a great company and have a great product, but there may or may not be demand for the shares. And as an investor trader, I wanna know, is there demand for the shares? You may sell a lot of widgets, 
but I want to know if people want your stock and I want to identify the trend in that security. So I made made myself. Um, it, it works the other way as well, right, Stan? When uh, when AMC is actually worth about six bucks a share, uh, demand can drive that to uh, pretty extreme levels. Yeah, and, and you know, and that's that's tough to reckon. You can leave that slide. That's perfect. Leave sure. that one. Um, that's a that's a perfect example, Tyler. Um, that that's a reconcile. How do we reconcile those actions and those activities? For one thing, for many of us, speaking for myself, but others as well. I would leave that action to someone else. That's not my piece of the price action. Mm -hmm. When I used to, um, as I said, I used to lecture a lot on technical analysis and, and algorithmic trading. <clears throat> One of the things I used to say is that you cannot have every tick. What you do is figure out where is the sweet spot for you. For someone, the sweet spot might be in very short term trading. For someone, it's in longer term. For someone else, it's in, in something with higher, higher leverage like futures. <clears throat> for someone else, it may be in um new frontiers like cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. um but so there is there there are markets and and there are styles there are time frames that suit us either for our own investing or for managing our clients money for for success and i always felt like if i can catch the piece of the market that i'm comfortable analyzing seeing and participating in there's always going to be something else out there for someone else to capitalize on and i cannot get every tick yeah. So when when there were things going on with AMC or GameStop, um, that wasn't. I'm not invalidating it. I'm just saying that that wasn't what I pursued. I looked at it and I analyzed it. Of course, I'm interested. Yeah. There's a fantastic, uh, perhaps one of the best technical fund managers of our generation uh, named Frank Teixeira, who was at Wellington for many years, and he said, uh, "You really have to know yourself as an investor, and if you don't." Stock market is a very expensive place to find out. So uh, I, I think you're in good company, Stan, with that uh, with that takeaway. I think Frank's Frank's advice uh, should be put up on everyone's wall, <laughs> right. right above the trading screen. <laughs> exactly. um, this slide was an illustration that I I got from Tyler, and I'm not sure where he got it, but um, Ralph Acampora this from Ralph Acampora about that concept of supply and demand for the shares of the company rather than for the company's products itself. And it, it was originally made with Apple. That's fine. It just gets across the point that at the top of this circle, you'll see we evaluate the company. What are its products, the PE ratios, how good is management, how supply chains, distribution, et cetera, et cetera, balance sheets. And the bottom is what's the supply and demand for the stock? What's the outlook? What's the uh, optimism, levels of optimism and pessimism about the stock? Is there volume? Is there a lot of wide interest in this company that's carrying momentum for it? So uh, as technicians, we tend to focus on the items in the beneath the apple, um, price, open interest, psychology of the market, sentiment, volume, supply and demand for the shares of the stock themselves. That's what we focus on. And we see that through price, volume and related statistics. Excellent. Um, go right ahead. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the backup, Tyler. No um, problem, Stan. So a couple of other things about technical analysis, and this is, I'm, I'm just going to throw some bullets at you, but these are all covered in the CMT program. They're critical parts of technical analysis. And then a few more definitions that I, that I do want to cover. So a part of technical analysis is organizing data. <clears throat> now, as technicians, as old school technicians, sometimes we're criticized for, for being chart readers. And is it tea leaves? And you're just performing magic on a graph. And what does it matter? And I, having um, spent time in this industry from the days of pencil and paper charts, right up through writing my own trading system algorithms, I, what I try and get across to people is that as the chart is critical, not just for what the image you might see or the patterns or, or the traditional interpretations, but the chart is also an organizational structure for the data. The organizational structure is how frequent I'm getting, a, I have a time series. That time series is coming at me quickly. Um, I have a huge, a huge number of individual data points in that time series. How do I organize it? How do I sample it? How do I check to see what's critical in it and what's just noise in it? So when you go through our program and you look at charts, we do have a lot about it in there about charts and there's a lot on the exams about charts. 
but also think ahead, which is, well, what does this chart mean to me in trying to um, develop a trading methodology, whether I make it rigid and systematic or not, what does it mean to me in developing a methodology? How does it let me see the critical parts of price action as opposed to the noise that's in there? So we cover bar charts, line charts, quite a bit on candlestick charts. We also cover point and figure charts. An old method, I have a lot of affection for that method, I'll tell you now, but um, it, it is important even if you decide after you've completed the program, point and figure is not a methodology you want to adopt. It may very well be that it gives you an understanding of that idea of noise versus signal and seeing through the data to the important points and not just all the chop that occurs all day and day after day. We go through the traditional price patterns, but um, the traditional price patterns of, of head and shoulders, and, and you'll see one actually in a few minutes, of head and shoulders, of triangles, of channels. <clears throat> we go pennants and flags. We go, we go through all those in the program, but we also do put them into a behavioral finance context. What is it that people are thinking when these patterns display? The reason these patterns occur is because buyers and sellers are acting at different levels. There are people who will argue, well, they're self-fulfilling. I disagree, but it's, a, it's an arguable and a, and a legitimate discussion. The price patterns occur because the actions of buyers and so, because the, the price patterns are made out of the psychology, the behavioral finance aspects of all the participants. Mm -hmm. We do cover Dow theory. We pay credit to Dow and his successors who organized his work into what we now call Dow theory. Um, some of the actual nuts and bolts <clears throat> of Dow theory may not be quite as applicable today in the same way, but they do provide a foundation of understanding price action, understanding uh, indexes versus individual securities, and of understanding uh, the marketplace as, um, as a broader machine that is best seen when it's working in concert, when it confirms itself, when it's working together. So we do have Dow theory covered um, because it's important to understand that history and how it has come forward. And uh, finally, uh, the last bullet on here is uh, indicators. Um, that word indicator is sometimes used um, a little too loosely, I think, but <clears throat> I, I prefer to, to define the word indicator in the technical analysis context as any mathematical formula that we use, uh, values, numbers, um, variables we derive from price and volume. And yes, also from things like open interest and things like commitments of traders data from the options market. Um, so things we derive from them. So they're, they're very common calculations like moving averages and the variations of moving averages. They involve greater complexity like uh, momentum-based oscillators. And they go into even, even further uh, for cycle analysis. We cover things related to cycle analysis that are mathematical formulas and that derive from price and volume and other related statistics. All of these are covered in the CMT program. Remember, it's three, it's three levels. We go into a greater detail and a shift of the emphasis as you go from level to level, but all of this is covered and rings through the, in, the entire program. Now, I wanna talk for a minute about quantitative analysis because the, the term comes up a lot. And uh, sometimes I hear, oh, you need more quantitative work in the, in the CMT program. And um, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but what does that mean? So um, I, I had an unusual uh, experience a few years ago of um, I was working for a, a US-based broker dealer and I was invited to speak at a quantitative analysis conference in communist China. And it was quite an experience. I met a number of members of the party, prominent members of the party. Um, I, uh, it, it was really, it was quite an experience. It was quite interesting. Um, but one of the things I pointed out was that what I tried to define quantitative analysis for this group. And the definition I gave them was that, <laughs> maybe it was a little tongue in cheek, was that they took technical analysis analysts and gave them computers. And then you had quantitative analysis. Mm -hmm. So the step in quantitative is using complex, this is from Investopedia, it's right off the web using complex mathematical and statistical modeling, measurement and research, assigning a numerical value to variables to replicate reality mathematically. That's a kind of a mouthful. But that's what we've been doing in technical analysis for a long time. Is it now more, well, codified, because since we do have computers to do a lot of this, do we create 
systems, automated systems, algorithmic systems, and I'll talk about the word algorithm in just a moment. Um, yes, but I want you to know that I think that they're a con on a continuum. I think technical analysis and quantitative analysis are on a continuum. We saw, I've known many programmers who, who are asked to uh, program something quantitative for trading purposes, and they don't have the, um, uh, they don't have the um, uh, market knowledge, the subject matter knowledge in order to, to be able to do that. Um, so it, I think it's on a continuum. And one of the reasons I'm telling you that is that as you go through the material, if your goal is quantitative work, if your goal, goal is systems trading, pay attention to the basics. When you say, well, I don't want to look at chart patterns. Who does that anymore? You will take that core fundamental knowledge and extend it into things you may automate later on. And the last definition I want to give you here is algorithmic trading. Again, because these words are, are thrown around uh, quite a bit. Um, algorithmic trading is step, algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure to solve logical and mathematical problems. I always define, I, I always broke algorithmic trading into two different categories for the purpose of, of discussion and purpose of our jargon. There's algorithmic order placement and management. In other words, I may have to, uh, I may have an algorithm. I, I want to accumulate two or 300,000 shares and I'll have an algorithm that's based on the VWAP, an algorithm that's based on a time slice, an algorithm that's based on some other formula, but it's executing the, I already made the decision to purchase. However, I made it and I'm using an algorithm to execute that. And then there's algorithmic decision-making, which is trading systems. There's algorithmic um, automated algorithms that say now is the time to buy or now is the time to sell. I'll, I'll tell you candidly, our focus here in, in the program, in the CMT program, is the decision-making aspect far more than the order placement and order management aspect. We allude to it and there's some discussion of it, of different styles of, of doing that, but clearly decision-making is what technical analysis is about. And that extends again from the traditional chart all the way through um, trading systems. Um, so there are three aspects of technical analysis that I think are very core concepts in, in our analysis. They're covered extensively in the CMT program. And I think they're, they're applicable to many different markets. One of them may be a little bit narrower, but, but we'll discuss it. Um, but I want to give them to you as a flavor of um, what's in the program, what you'll be learning about. And I have some current market charts that'll pop up in there so we can see some examples of, of what they what they look like. So the three core concepts I'd like to talk about are relative strength. I'd like to talk about breadth. Uh, breadth is a, a stock market specific concept. So it wouldn't be something you would apply to futures or to cryptocurrency, but it, it applies to the stock stock market here and, and anywhere, frankly, in the US or elsewhere, and the concept of divergence. So if we talk about those three, we'll do some definitions and look at a couple of charts, and then I, I'll, I'll be finished chewing your ear off. So let's start <laughs> with relative strength. First of all, for those of you who are have one foot in the program already, or those of you who have one foot in technical analysis already, we are not talking about the relative strength index. We are not talking about RSI. So there is an indicator called RSI, which is the uh, which are the initials for relative strength index. And there is something called relative strength. And by the way, if you are sitting for the exams, please know that definitional difference between the two. It may get you a point. <laughs> <laughs> relative strength, I have a, a, a quote from Martin Pring. Technical concept that measures the relationship between two securities. What is the relative strength of one versus the other? The simplest way to do it, one security divided by another, the ratio between the two. Relative strength can be used for uh, uh, an intermarket relationship. It can be used to compare, um, a comp most commonly probably, it's used to compare, let's say, uh, a security to its peers or to security to an index of its peers. So you might look at a tech stock versus a tech index. It could be two different markets completely, um, but the idea in this case, you have to really focus on that word relative because relative strength means it's not telling us which is going up and which is going down. It's telling us which one is relatively stronger than the other. 
So there's been a lot of discussion lately about growth versus value. That's what these two um, tickers are. The top one is S&P growth. Uh, the bottom one is uh, S&P value, they're, they're ETFs. And uh, I don't know all the components. I don't have them here. We're just using this as a thumbnail to compare them. So which one is stronger? That's kind of a silly question, to just to put it that simply. But you can see this period, this is these are daily charts, goes back about three years. So you can see the period when the pandemic hit, that sharp break in early 2020, and the bull market that has ensued since early 2020. Weekly well, chart. when we look at it, we get the sense of which one is stronger than the other. We get the sense of, of, uh, of the, the growth looking better than value and making new highs more recently, while, while uh, value on the bottom, the green chart, seems to have stalled somewhat. How do we do that in technical analysis? As Pring's definition said, we just look at a ratio. So if you click to the next slide, you'll see that I put up the ratio line. So there's an additional line on the chart. It's an indicator, and it's very, very simple. It's the one price divided by the other, one divided by the other, just the ratio. We often do these with smoothings. We can do these with a simple, simple arithmetic average, with an exponential average. We can use other smoothing methods. This is not smooth. This is just the raw ratio. And it's clear from the raw ratio when that ratio is rising, now it's, it's, it's growth divided by value in this case. So a rising line means the numerator is stronger than the denominator. Growth was stronger than value. It doesn't mean that growth was going up. It means it was going up more than value or down less than value. It's relative strength. So you can see the period of relative strength really began before the market broke. If you can see that period in early, late 2019, and it began to turn in early 2020, before that sharp market sell-off, we already had a movement of strength into growth at that point, and that continued. You'll see it set back. We don't have to analyze it tick by tick in here, but this is a simple, we call it an RS line or an RS ratio line or a ratio line, and we're easily able to see one versus the other. Now, one of the drawbacks, of analyzing relative strength this way is I can only do it with two securities. I can only divide one by the other and get a meaningful line. The line, the, you'll notice on the, all the way on the right where there's a scale that I, I took the numbers out because they mean nothing. All the way at the bottom, we see the indicator. I took the numbers out because the ratio itself means nothing. What we're looking for is the trend in the ratio. That's what's critical. So how can I analyze more than one at a time? How can I analyze multiple securities or indexes, markets at a time? How can I not only see them historically, but see their relative value? One of the things we cover in, in the course is a relatively new charting format called a relative rotation graph, RRG. This RRG was developed over the last, I guess, about 15 years or so, and it's become very popular. It's a very interesting way of looking at multiple symbols. In this case, I put up a group of ETFs, what they are is not really critical at the moment. There's a legend on the right if you want to look. I put up a group that so you can see that what we're looking for in this case, remember it's a relative rotation graph. So each of the quadrants represents strength versus weakness and strengthening versus weakening. There's a legend in the corners if you can see it. You can take a look at it. We won't, it's not, a, this is not a class, so I'm not going to belabor it too much but you can see what's leading, but what may be leading, it may be, the ratio may be high now and it may still be high tomorrow, but not as high. Mm -hmm. So we're looking in here for not only what's stronger than something else, but what's strengthening compared to something else. What is the trend of that? You can see from this, even without looking at the legend in detail, that it's been tough the last, the last few, uh, these, this is a, uh, these are uh, weekly, so it's been tough the last few months. Mm -hmm. This question among professionals is the, this growth value question, this large cap, small cap question. That's really been a challenge, and you can see that reflected in this graph. What seems to be, this is all, by the way, versus the S&P. So this, when I say relative strength in this particular graph, this is these ETFs versus the S&P. So you'll see that we do seem to have some turning now where smaller caps and growths are coming, are turning back. 
And the, the mega like, cap growth at MGK is starting to to weaken, maybe versus the broader versus the broader market. All this is part of the CMT program and covering relative strength, one item versus another, a traditional relative strength line, and the current iteration of that, the the newly invented, newly in the last decade or so, relative rotation graph. Mm -hmm. Now the next topic I wanted to cover is breadth. Breath is, uh, when, we, when we talk about a market, we talk about a stock market in particular, and that's what we're focused on with breath. And you can put up that, that definition if you want to click, Tyler, thanks. What we're focused on here is getting inside a market. Now, when I say a market, I mean an index, whether it's S&P 500 or the Russell 2000 or an index in another country or a sector index. We want to measure the imbalance between advancing and declining stocks. If I tell you the S&P 500 was up 1% today, the first question should be, well, how many of the 500 stocks, and there are actually a few more than 500 at the moment, I think, how many of the 500 stocks were up and how many were down? In other words, did that advance in the S&P? Was that because the, as, as Ralph liked to say, all the soldiers were moving in the right direction or just some of them were moving a lot and it, pushed the numbers for the S&P, and really most of the stocks were not doing very well. So breadth is very carefully studied for, this is for understanding what's going on inside a stock market, measures the imbalance between advancing and declining, a net increase in the advanced decline index in the, cat, in the, in the indicator, where while more issues are declining, should generate concern that the upwards move is poorly supported. That's the example I just gave you with the, the soldiers. And if you click on the next slide is a little, uh, uh, not the next bullet, thank you. The next is a little koan we used to talk about over uh, after, after work, which was, is it a stock market or a market of stocks? We tend to look at the index and we tend to look at, well, gee, let's, you know, I should be long the S&P or I should be long the Dow or I should be short the Russell. And those are all valid. And of course you put them into play in different ways, but that those numbers are not in themselves those numbers are themselves the reflection of a market of stocks underneath. And that's what breath is all about. Stan, if, if I could take just a look add at the next chart. Go ahead, Tyler. In, please. In our community of technical analysts, uh, I think breadth studies are even more important today than in years past because we're working with a marketplace where top 10 stocks represent such an overweighted representation of the rest of the index. Uh, yes. For those that are cap weighted, like the SP 500 just a few names can really move things around. And actually last night, uh, David Lundgren, who's one of our board members, made the point that for momentum investors, if you were trying to find securities with high momentum and that was a factor you were using, those top, uh, top 20 names aren't even high momentum names, but they are such a large portion of the index that you can't, on a relative basis, you can't beat your benchmark. You can't outperform the index if you are a momentum investor this year because those top names don't even represent high momentum uh, uh, stocks. So the the calculation and the composition of the indices has certainly been skewed by the fact that these mega cap uh, names have have really outsized both their sector ETFs as well as the whole index. So well, for, and, and for someone with um, with as much gray hair as I have, um, I you asked don't the have question, that much. What happened to the stock yeah. split? <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing as a stock split anymore. Yeah. So, well, there is. So, what? Uh, somebody split recently. I forget who it was. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the GE, I think, just did a reverse or something. Um, <laughs> it, my, my point being that that, and Tyler's point is that so much of um, the concentration in the index is in such few names that it is hard to parse out. That gets into how the index is constructed, what the weighting system is for the index, which is something that we do cover in the program as well. Um, but there, there is, you know, quite a bit of of detail um, to go into that. And um, so breath, uh, the other thing I would mention related to breath is I uh, grew up, if you will, in the futures industry. And that's really where I did much work before I got more involved in stocks and options. Um, and there's no such thing as breath in the futures world. It just, it doesn't, doesn't add up. It, it, there is no, there's just no such thing. It's not that that analysis doesn't exist. There is no such data. So this was something I came to relatively late in the analysis work I was doing. Um, so, and I'm telling, 
I'm telling our candidates, our listeners out there, can- candidly, that it's in the program, you're going to have to learn it. And it is important. And if, if you're a specialist in certain areas, if you're a specialist in, in oil or in metals or in ags, or you're a specialist in Forex, this may not be something that you, that you apply. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at one chart, and then we'll go on to divergence, and we'll stay on, on track here. So I put up um, a, a breath line, advanced decline line. So the chart is the Russell 2000. Uh, it's IWM. It's the ETF for the Russell 2000 daily candlestick. So that could get covers a period since uh, April 19. So it, it's, um, uh, you know, two and a half years or so that's in there. And you'll see the sharp sell off in early 2020. And the blue line on the bottom is the advanced decline line. And it's a raw line. It is not smooth, average. There's nothing applied to it, just a raw Russell 2000 advanced decline line. And I had shown this in a previous presentation that Tyler and I did. So I went back to look again and I just updated the same chart. And I thought it was very interesting, so I kept the same one rather than looking for a different example. Mm-hmm. And if you walk through this from left to right, you'll see the period prior to March, February, March 2020, right? You're pointing in the exact right spot. So the market had some upward drift. We made new highs right before that sharp break. The advanced decline line was healthy. We were seeing new highs in there. But the advanced decline line started to weaken before that hard break when the pandemic stared us in the face. And you'll see there was a support line that was broken. I, I pointed to the red arrows. I put the red arrows in there and they are at the same week. Those are weekly candlesticks, the same week in the advanced decline line and in the, the IWM data up on top. So the advanced decline line broke support, pretty long standing support uh, three weeks or so before the break began of the pandemic. Was that an immediate sell signal? Well, for somebody, maybe. It's one piece of the evidence. We always talk about weight of the evidence. I need to to put together uh, tools that give me a view on the market, and then I need to weigh them and see how they look together. But we're just looking at a piece of evidence in isolation, of course. Well, with the sell sell off, the breath, the advanced decline line certainly got hammered. That oval is a head and shoulders that was in there and that we pointed out in our last presentation. Well few presentations ago, I guess, but I circled the that head and shoulders, and then I drew a line in red to the right out of that, which is at the top of the of the um, right shoulder. So that, uh, the way that green arrow is, is what I'm calling the breakout in breath at that point. From the inverse. Um, you'll see the shoulder. green arrows in the same spot, uh, the, the same time spot, the same weekly bar on IWM, and the market, even if you, you didn't if you were just using this, which I would suggest not doing, just using this, but you would not have caught the exact bottom, but none of us do. I want to see if I can catch the bulk of the trend. Right there, it came out, and you'll see how that support line breaking out of that neckline, that red line across um, in 2020, that breath really held that line. There was one, one, two, three, four, five, six touches of it while the market was rising, but that breath line never broke down. Now, what's kind of interesting between the dotted verticals, and I'll leave this with you, we've been going sideways for quite a while, and yet breath has been doing very, very well, or at least it had been, and it was sideways, then it made new high again. So there is some question in here about, well, if if the breath is this good, if more of the Russell 2000 are going up than down, this is a raw statement, why is it that this is flat? Again, weight of the evidence, I'm pointing that out because no one tool, no one indicator tells us everything. But at the very least, this rising breath, while it might frustrate me that I wasn't getting further advances in this ETF, it certainly would have kept me in and I would have been in one piece because the market did hold its strength in this regard. A little bit more concern is that, and I made these charts just last week, we did have a new high in breath and not a new high, perfect segue to divergence and not, did not get a new high at the very, all the way on the right in the advanced decline line. And of course, we've, we've seen some weakness in the last, in the past week or so. All right, the last item, and we'll stay on track here, is divergence analysis. Um, one of the things that we do with indicators, we use indicators to help us see important price action, important price trends, important price levels, 
that we might not see when we look at that full time series. It goes back to what I was talking about before with charting, um, whether it's learning to separate signal and noise, whether it's learning to um, <clears throat> um, identify the critical points, our data sampling. Well, indicators are kind of analogous to that. Why do we make, I can look at the chart, what do I need a moving average for? Well, the whole idea would be that a moving average cuts out some of the noise, doesn't, it takes my eye away from the, the constant fluctuation and lets me see trend. So indicators, calculations made from price, volume, breadth, you've seen them here. They're used to identify important market action to separate signal from noise. That's the critical thing about indicators. And when it comes to divergence, the indicator, obviously the indicator should, should indicate, should indicate direction or, or momentum or lack of. So what I'm looking for, and you can click the next bullet, the technical analyst asks, does the indicator confirm the price action? That's the core question. If not, then I have a divergence. There are other aspects, many other aspects to looking at this, but this is the core question. Does the indicator confirm the price action? Gee, the market is moving higher, whatever market I'm looking at, but the indicator is not. What is that telling me? We just discussed that with IWM. I don't have a conclusive answer for you on that, but I would look at other tools. I would look were there changes in the index, were there changes in the reporting system, was there check, I certainly would check my data, but mm -hmm. were, there, were there changes in the uh, in in some other aspect of how this is is being calculated or analyzed, and I would get deep, do a deeper dive. Does the indicator confirm the price action? So the example I put up here is uh, Bitcoin. Now. Um, I know, I know that it's certainly there's a lot of interest in cryptocurrency these days. Um, what I put up here, what I'm using here to, to full disclosure is the, CM, the CME reports a Bitcoin index. Um, so this, uh, they, they gather data from multiple dealers and they report an index. And this is often what I use in charting. Full disclosure, I don't trade cryptocurrencies. Um, that's not a value judgment. I just don't. Um, maybe that'll change in the future, but I don't and I haven't. So I'm not, I don't have any affinity for one particular dealer's reporting or one particular service. I do have an affinity for the futures industry. So I am using this coming from the CME group from the futures exchange as a nonpartisan index. And what you see on the bottom is a, a momentum oscillator. It happens to be a relative strength index, by the way, it's RSI. But for our purposes, it's a momentum oscillator. Now, these are daily bars on the Bitcoin real-time index from the CME. You'll see the chart begins in late 2020. So it covers uh, roughly a year. You'll see that sharp rise that we had. But notice the four peaks that we had in Bitcoin and the four lower peaks in RSI. Now, each time that was happening, a technical analyst had to say, I have new high in price not confirmed by the indicator. Remember, the core question is, does the indicator confirm the price action? On each of these occasions, the indicator did not confirm the price action. Now, was that a time to sell? Well, maybe for shorter term trading within the context of the trend, that's up to you. But the trend did continue. The trend continued actually until momentum was outright, was outright negative. Now we had that sharp break in uh, in the in the spring or I guess early summer late spring um, and we see that the um, uh, in that in, during that hard break again RSI was negative momentum was negative now we had a positive a bullish divergence in other words we see the two lows in Bitcoin and that was uh, I guess mid spring into early summer and then higher lows in RSI, higher lows in momentum. Mm -hmm. That was a tip off that maybe the market was sold out. Again, don't take this in isolation. What other tools am I using? If I sell, if I had sold on the first divergence, I would have missed a lot going higher. Mm -hmm. If I had bought on the first diver bullish divergence here and a few months ago, I might have had to suck wind for quite a while before the market really got going. Yeah. But we see the divergences in both of these, and I thought it was very, very interesting. People I know, experienced technicians I know who are, are involved in cryptocurrencies, 
um, have mentioned a number of times, and that's really what drew my attention to so much of this, it, that, that we don't know where this will be. We don't know where this is going as a, as a market, as a financial instrument, um, but the technical aspects have been very, very interesting when applied to liquid cryptocurrencies. I have not done anything except look at Bitcoin, so I'm not uh, I'm not pushing you into anything, but I, I've just been tracking this as I begin to learn more about that that particular area. Stan, um, if, I, if I could add one thing please. on this chart, uh, I get the unique privilege of, of interviewing some of our members for the Fill the Gap podcast, and our third guest this year was Walter Deemer, who is 55 years in the business and a, a really remarkable gentleman, uh, and he talked about how you know we're all living in this world of uncertainty and that some of these indicators are, are measuring the mood of the crowd. We're, we're looking for which direction is it gonna go? And the, the best takeaway from that episode, which you can find for free on any, anywhere podcasts are streaming, he said, from failed moves come fast moves. So right here, people are looking, is, is the bottom in on Bitcoin? And you look at this momentum oscillator and it's starting to try to break out and fails. Right, we're reconfirming that there's another leg down, and that's all this does is capture that behavior of the crowd. Um, but it's it's beautiful to see on the chart, so elegant and simple. But I also I, I thought uh, Walter's takeaway that if you're looking for these indicators and everything's stacking up, saying you know it's it's going to crash and it doesn't, then there's something really important going on under the surface that we will only understand in hindsight. But from yep. failed moves come fast moves. Yep, another charter holder I worked with uh, over the years, who was in fact one of my sponsors, um, mm -hmm. used to say that when the when the the probable move or what you consider the probable move doesn't happen, it's the opposite that you yeah. have to look for. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I can get you into a whipsaw, but but Walter's point Walter's point is well taken. Um, the the work done with um, you pointed out that failed attempt at turning the momentum. Um, that's something also that that is covered quite a bit in 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 our in our material and I've done a lot of work with 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 RSI in particular momentum oscillators is um, uh, the momentum oscillator is sometimes RSI sometimes looked at for overbought and oversold, but I think its greatest value is a trend following tool. And that's another discussion altogether. That doesn't that doesn't change the divergence uh, right. analysis aspect of this. But yes, the, the technical tools here, I know that um, uh, there are a lot of traditional technical tools applied. Uh, if, you're going, if, if any of our listeners are going to apply these to any market, but specifically crypto, the only thing I would say is, is there liquidity? Does that market represent a broad participation or at least broad um, uh, public access to the data? And that it's not just um, a few large players pulling strings here or there and that sometimes happens with perhaps with bitcoin in terms of headlines as well um mm -hmm. but but be be cautious with that a market that's um very publicly traded where the data is very easy to accumulate where the data is broadly available to people that's the kind of market for technical analysis and one other point i'll make and then i'll turn it back to you tyler is that the um you connected very well what you were talking about in Bitcoin, where you're talking about Walter's comments from the podcast, mm -hmm. um, technical analysis with psychology and behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. um, when years ago, I remember, you know, four, 14 is the conventional length on an RSI, Wells Wilder's RSI. That's one mm -hmm. of the first tools I learned to use years ago. Mm -hmm. And well, I, the first things you learn when you learn to use RSI are overbought and oversold. In other words, looking for extreme and reversion. In that sense, I said I turn that around a little bit in some of my work, as do others. But looking, but so so someone said, well, how could that possibly work? Well, I said, to you, I said, well, it measures how up the market a market has been in the last 14 bars or days, and how down it's been in the last 14 bars or days. Mm -hmm. So I asked a question. I said, if you had a market that was up 14 days in a row, would you buy it? And most people will say, well, no. If it's up 14 days in a row, I'm waiting for it to go down before I buy it. <laughs> That's RS, RSI is the mathematical expression of that. Yep. And um, it was an excellent point you made about tying what we see on the chart, the psychology, the sentiment, tying that to what we look at mathematically, which was always 
credit to Wells Wilder for the RSI, which was always an attempt at understanding market psychology mm -hmm. through mathematics, through yeah. price interpretation. Uh, the uh, the great Ralph Acampora added to me. I said, "Oh well, when it when it reaches uh, an overbought extreme, then then you sell, right?" He says, "No, you hold." <laughs> he said, it's at an overbought extreme. It hasn't turned. And uh, he said to the opposite, right? Oversold extremes. Oh, let's load up. Let's buy. He said, imagine if I gave you a beach ball and you held it under the water and then let go and that beach ball didn't come back up. You'd be wondering where the hell that beach ball came from. <laughs> There's something seriously wrong. <laughs> so take that for what it is. Uh, we're, we're looking at what is actually happening right now. These tools help us uh, understand that. Stan, what a uh, what a, a quick run through of a lot of material. You even touched on support and resistance and the polarity without even knowing it. Uh, a lot of a lot of subject matter from the CMT program. So I'm going to buzz through just a couple of slides here uh, for those of you who uh, who need to run to the trading desk and uh, and get back to your day job. I understand, but let's uh, let's just talk a little bit about the CMT program specifically. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of uh, of the talk this morning. Your next opportunity to sit for the CMT program is going to be December 2nd through the 12th. That's coming up. It's about 100 days away. Uh, Stan, do you have any comments about you know people who are just starting their study plan right now for the December cycle of exams? Yeah, the main thing I would have is uh, for your study plan is have one. <laughs> Great advice. Uh, yeah, look at you know I have an ideal I have an ideal study plan that most of us don't follow that. I didn't follow perfectly either. Um, the ideal study plan is read the book once, <laughs> then go back and read it again um, <laughs> in detail. Um, but in all seriousness, take a look uh, at the book, divide up the content. We, we divide it in sections. We try and make it somewhat bite size. It's not per it's far from perfect. Um, mm -hmm. But try and figure out how much you would have to cover in order to finish your at least your first study through with about 10 days or so to go before the exams. As you go through it, read the learning objectives at the beginning of every chapter. I wrote the learning objectives in cooperation with others, but I'm on top of each of those learning objectives. I know what's in the chapters, and I also am involved in the exams. Read the learning objectives from the chapter, and when you read the chapter, take some notes, make sure you understand what's there, Go back then and read the learning objectives again and make sure you're sat, you've satisfied them for yourself. Yep. They really are the key. I'm not claiming perfection, far from it, but it really will give you a guide. Some of the chapters cover additional material that's important. There could be additional related material on the exam, but if you can satisfy those learning objectives, you'll be in pretty good shape when you sit for the exams. Have the study plan, leave yourself time for review at the end, and then the last day, have a nice meal and try and get some sleep. Yeah. Uh, to that point, uh, everybody who's online right now, you can see in the handouts section of GoToWebinar, all of those learning objectives. At, at whatever level you are sitting for uh, this December, you can pop those PDFs off right now, download them, uh, take a look through all those learning objective statements for each of the three levels of the exam. All right. We talked at the beginning about the value that the CMT charter represents. We've also spent most of this morning talking about the ways in which technical analysts are going to add value to their firms and to uh, uh, to their clients. You know, when Stan was talking about uh, the relative strength chart earlier, we, we all watch financial news media. Right? I can't help it. It's like seeing a car crash on the highway. I have to look at it. Uh, and, and this spring, we talked a lot. We heard the pundits talking about rising interest rates and a return to value and, uh, you know, the, the expression of the return economy, industrials are going to outperform some of these cyclical sectors and looking at value stocks for the next bid higher. Well, as a technical analyst in your firm, uh, maybe stop talking about the narrative, stop listening to the storytelling and just look at what's actually happening and having tools to measure that relative strength to know that, oh, we've got a return to growth. Uh, you know, you, you would have seen it before the pundits and that that expresses extreme value to your clients and your firms because you have a differentiated understanding of, of how to skin the same cat. All right. Focus on what's happening instead of why. Yeah, what's happening instead of why. Uh, 
main topic areas, the, the learning objective statements are really where you guys need to focus. Uh, but just thinking about the core knowledge domains, if you're trying to explain uh, to somebody why the CMT program matters, it's these four areas of study that are going to lead you to uh, better investment decisions. Um, quick update on the exams themselves. Uh, CMT Association experienced the, the global pandemic as well as everyone else. Uh, we work with Prometric uh, testing centers all over the world, uh, physical locations, and uh, for many years, that is how all candidates sat for the exams. Exact same exam, exact same experience, whether you're in Kentucky or Kuala Lumpur, it's, it's a uniform and secure testing environment. Uh, given the COVID pandemic, uh, we worked with those partners, I, I should say Stan and our colleague Marie, worked very closely with those partners uh, to ensure the same uniform testing environment, the same exam security through an online remotely proctored exam. Uh, so I know a lot of you uh, probably sat for a remotely proctored exam last year or some point in the last couple of cycles. Uh, this is going to be a part of the CMT program henceforth. Uh, so if you are, uh, you know, far flung, far far afield from major financial centers as I am these days, uh, this is a great option for you to consider in sitting for the exams. A lot more detail about what's required on our site uh, in terms of setting up your home or office uh, for testing. A uh, quick note about the uh, the curriculum and the material. Um, fantastic introduction to technical analysis at level one. We we always ask our guests on the podcast, and I talk to uh, a lot of our speakers at conferences and events. You know, if you're going to uh, point a young learner to a, a great text to get started understanding technical analysis, and uh, you know, we get a lot of comments about Edwards and McGee or about John Murphy's books or about uh, Kirkpatrick Dahlquist's text. Uh, those are in there. <laughs> and the, uh, the greatest consolidated textbook that I have found that covers a wide uh, variety of the topics is the official CMT curriculum. Uh, so we work with Wiley, they are our publisher. Uh, and our friends over there asked me to share with you all a uh, discount code if you are uh, still in need of getting the official curriculum to study for the exams, you can enter that code CMTTW30. Uh, to take 30% off of uh, your purchase for that curriculum. Uh, that's at efficientlearning.com forward slash CMT. They've got a lot of other products that Wiley has developed in terms of uh, test review and preparation. Uh, feel free to check those out, but it's the curriculum that's the CMT association. We actually edit and compile uh, that core official curriculum for the CMT program. And as Stan says, you may have learned it one way on the trading desk. <laughs> it will be tested on the way that it is explained in the uh, in the textbook. Did I get that right, Stan? You got it right. <laughs> All right. We're technicians. We know that just reading this material in a book is not going to give you the experiential learning that you need to really retain and digest all of this knowledge that's coming at you. So we partnered with Optima, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Verdau, uh, really an an excellent person and a great uh, ambassador for the CMT charter. He actually extends access to his software program, Optima, to all of the candidates in the CMT program. And what was really unique about this partnership is that we want all candidates to have a great charting tool, but also as you move through levels two and level three, there's more emphasis on the expression and the synthesis of all these tools. You're gonna need to understand and objectify and codify how the tools work and statistically how relevant they are. A lot of those back testing tools, a lot of the experiential and quantitative methods for expressing the technical tools are right there in Optima as well. Um, so by all means, when you're thinking about the value of the program and learning all this material, also having access to a, a very robust software package for free uh, makes that uh, a really great value proposition. The other announcement that I wanted to make, I know we uh, we work with CFA societies all over the world and uh, many in, of our charter holders are now dual CFA, CMT. We've talked a lot about, you know, just remember that graph of, uh, of, of the Apple company versus the Apple stock. We believe technical analysis uh, is a complementary discipline to all of the other ways in which you might look at the markets or companies that you are investing in. Uh, for CFA charter holders, after uh, after 2018, there is an exemption on the level one exam. CFA charter holders can come into the CMT program beginning at level two, which doesn't mean that you're not responsible for all of the, the uh, cursory knowledge at level one, 
but we recognize through a curriculum mapping process that the CFA charter holders have covered a lot of the same topics and uh, we wanted to provide that glide path uh, for everyone who's out there. So for those of you on the line who are CFA charter holders, you can check that out right on our website as well uh, to take advantage of that exemption on your uh, CMT exams. But you don't have to take my word for that. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of testimonials, a lot of video footage of our dual charter holders. We've got a lot of content within our virtual uh, conference archives talking about how people blend those disciplines and how they would think about evaluation metric and technical metrics all in the same investment process. Uh, so be sure, spend a little time on the site. Uh, we're, we're not dogmatic and, and I don't think the, uh, the good folks at CFA Institute are anymore either. Um, We've talked a lot about these positive changes. I wanna just hit on a couple more. We've simplified the membership process. There are no prerequisites for sitting for the CMT exams. Anyone who is a current or aspiring professional can go through the program. And in fact, we've got a lot of university students who are using their success at level one and level two to help them land a, a job on Wall Street or Bay Street or Dalal Street, wherever they're at, uh, to, to make sure that the employers know just how committed they are uh, to that job role and to uh, the financial services industry. Uh, so there are no prerequisites to sitting for the CMT exams. Um, we also, we talked about the remote proc proctoring and the consolidated curriculum. Uh, I wanted to just mention that there's uh, a, a lot of opportunity through our academic partner program uh, for students to take advantage of uh, some extreme scholarships on the level one exam. So if you are professor on the line with us this morning, uh, you can shoot me an email, tyler at cmtassociation.org. Happy to point you in the right direction and get you uh, connected with our academic partner program. This is a, a technical analysis uh, uh, informational session, so why not end it with a chart? Uh, this just looks at the, uh, the CMT candidates by test cycle. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are over 10,000 candidates now involved in the program at one level or another. And each cycle, uh, we continue to have more and more test takers, more new charter holders coming onto, uh, onto the street in the industry, uh, and a much greater recognition of the value of the CMT charter by regulators, employers, and everyone alike. So uh, let's catch the, the bulk of that move. I'm glad you are here with us this morning. You're entering at a great time. M momentum resurging in the direction of the trend. Uh, you, guys are, you guys are gonna do great. This is, uh, this is where I just say thank you very much for uh, spending your morning with us and uh, thank you, Stan, for sharing all of the, uh, the insights and the wisdom um, and leave you with this. If you would like to save $100 and register right now for the CMT program coming up this December, there is your discount code to save $100, D21CFA100. And that is it for us. Stan, any closing comments you have for our audience this afternoon? No, I, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank everyone for, for listening in and um, keep, keep looking at the charts. They tell the story. <laughs> Wonderful. We've got just a couple questions uh, that I'm happy to, uh, to tackle real quick for those of you who are still on the line. Um, we've got Nitin who is asking about uh, any research or good books on uh, Fibonacci analysis and divergence, uh, how you would use retracement uh, and extension levels together with other technical analysis methods. Do you have any advice, Stan? Wow, um, I don't have a book off the top of my head that that's specialized. You can send me an email, or if you send it to admin, it'll go to me, uh, if you're listening, um, or stan at cmtassociation.org, and I'll, I'll see what I can think of or come up with a reference for you. Perfect. Uh, Jeremy was asking, uh, on a daily TLT chart, uh, February 1st, 2021 began a cup and handle formation that may break out today. What could this mean for the equities market? Uh, <laughs> bonds to stocks, that's a detailed question, Jeremy. And I, I think what would be best is to place that in the candidate network. Uh, so right on harvest for all candidates in the program, as well as recent, uh, recently granted charter holders, there's an ongoing asynchronous discussion. There's a lot of discussion about preparing for the exam but also some commentary about what, what we're seeing in the markets right now. And that is a great place uh, to start beginning your networking activity with other members of the association. Uh, recording will be available, Zach, on the website, uh, probably this afternoon. We'll make sure to, you can get that. Here's a very important question from Jordan. Do I need to schedule an actual test date 
Yes, Jordan. Thank you for asking. Uh, the process is, uh, as I just had on this last slide, you enroll in the CMT program. You register for the level of exam that you're, you're that you're taking. If I'm registering for level two, uh, that's that's the exam that I register for with the CMT Association, and then I need to go schedule my exam to ensure my success. So that that link out to Prometric websites uh, to make sure that you can schedule your exam either for in person or remote proctoring. Uh, there's a, a ton of detail about that in the ongoing communications that go out to all candidates once you register. But if you have any trouble, please send us an email, admin, admin at cmtassociation.org. We will take care of you right away and make sure that you get that test scheduled at your preferred date and time. Stan, I believe we have covered all of the questions and all of the slides. That brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we will see you again next time. Wishing you every bit of success on the exams this December. Stan, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Stay well.